uh, Julian Legrand, somebody was quoted by you as saying the National Health Service was the last bastion of the Soviet Union. And you said it in a way which seemed to me to suggest that you agree. Do you agree? Last bastion of the Soviet Union? It certainly used to be. That's before um, a number of us got our hands on it. And what did you do to turn it round? Well, I think when I began to work in government, what we were told was that the real problem with National Health Service is not enough money. All you do is pour money at it, and the doctors and nurses and the kind of intrinsic motivation uh, of doctors and nurses and managers within the NHS would carry it through. We tried it. It didn't work. Um, it became clear that you need, if you've got a failing hospital, and actually it's probably true of a failing school or other public yeah. sector institution too, you've got a failing hospital, you need some kind of external pressure. And the question is, the difficult question is, where does that pressure come from? And where does it come from in the whole? And your reading of it is a kind of internal market kind of stuff, where hospitals bid with each other, or schools you mentioned, yeah. who bid for, as it were, customers, in inverted commas, used to be called parents yeah. and pupils. Well, one form of pressure is indeed exactly that, is market pressure. It's pressure from competition. Uh, either parental choice in the case of schools or patient choice in the case of, of hospitals. Other sources of pressure are the government itself. And we went through that. Um, I don't know if you remember all the targets, uh, mm -hmm. the targets in performance management. It became rapidly known as targets in terror. Uh, where basically the government, and this is very much the Soviet Union bit, uh, where the government actually uh, directed, firmly, firmly directed what hospitals were supposed to do and exacted penalties on the hospitals that failed, usually yeah. the chief executive losing their job. And then there's a kind of, you also get a kind of pressure from the voice of patients uh, through things like patient and public forum or going on the board. On the whole, the government that I was involved with, which was the Blair government, uh, they went down the list, uh, they, were, they, they tried all of these. They're all, they're all bad, none of them work, but some worked less badly than others, and we conclude in the end that the best way was probably competition. Well, what it looks like, competition, is a way in which private business can infiltrate into the public sector, so that it looks a bit like covert privatisation. Yes, we keep getting the privatisation accusations. So well, speak. maybe there's some in truth fact, in it then. In fact, it's not, but it's not necessarily. I mean, of course you can get competition from private sector operators. In fact, the vast bulk of the competition within the NHS actually comes from public sector institutions, trusts, what they call foundation trusts and so on. These are, these are the real activations of competition. Now, you get a little bit of competition in the private sector. No bad thing, actually, because the private sector often does things rather more effectively and efficiently than the public sector does. So having an element of competition there... Uh, is good, um, but it isn't the the program isn't some sort of wholesale excuse for massive privatisation. But the parents or the patients, either of them, they they sort of just want to have a good doctor or you know a good school. They don't want to be told a big lecture by Michael Gove about free or academy or you can go to that hospital or this hospital. They want trust. They want to be, as it were, pawns, don't they? Well, but it's, that's exactly the point. Um, actually, when you ask parents or you ask. Um, Patients, do they mind? Are they, are they interested in who actually runs the hospital, uh, whether it's private sector or public sector or a charity or a voluntary sector? They say, no, I couldn't care, hang about that. All I want is my child to get a good education or myself to get a good health care. That's the important thing, and that's what we were trying to achieve. How far does it go, though? I mean, police, army, roads, I can think of a heck of a lot of stuff to which, in logic, it would seem to rely government itself. Well, competition, I think, I mean, competition has its limits. I mean, there are, there are some places where it wor works, other places where it doesn't. Things like the police and the army are clearly problematic, although it is quite interesting. You are seeing the development of private security forces of various kinds. I must say, I'm not very attracted by that. I think there are real dangers of the profit motive operating in those contexts, which really does not have the same sort of damaging but, effects as it does in the, in the health and education sectors. But it sounds to me as though you're saying, ooh, intuitively, I don't like that, so I'm going to pull back from that. But the logic of your position, surely, is what you prepare for the work of others is to push privatisation right the way through the system. No, it's not pushing privatisation, it's pushing competition. Now, competition provides the right kind of incentives. Now, the danger with competition, uh, and as indeed with any kind of external pressure, is that it demotivates the people internally. It... it the, the extrinsic motivation demotivates the kind that reduces the intrinsic motivation. If you were still senior policy advisor to the Prime Minister and he called you in and said, or she, and said, everything's ready, we're going to implement immediately one policy of your choice, it'll all work, what would it be? More competition. Julian Rao, thank you very much for subjecting yourself to the Geertie Grinnings. Thank you.